Um, so I'm Abby Finnis at the Great Plains Institute, the director of the program. Uh, it's been a while since I've been here. I, I did come to the last workshop and we were in St. Cloud for the one in December, which was pretty great. Um, so it's good to be back. Uh, I think we're going to do a quick little bit of introduction to see who's in the room and then Kristen can give us a fun fact. Um, and then we'll get into the topic of water quality, um, which I think is becoming more and more of a pressing issue, uh, especially in a state where we have such great water resources. Um, and we think it's abundant and great and healthy, uh, and so we don't take care of it quite as well as we should. Um, so our icebreaker, I think, is to think about what your favorite water activity is, and that can be on frozen water or it can be on um, so I think uh, my favorite water activity is probably canoeing. I'm Kristen Peterson from Great Plains Institute, and my favorite water activity is swimming in lakes in the summer. And if folks online want to just set their favorite activity, that would be nice to talk to. Uh, I'm Rachel Olmanson, and I think my favorite activity would probably be canoeing, too. So. Uh, I'm Brooke Osterson with the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, and I think my favorite, well, the activity I do the most these days is play with my kids in the water, so. <laughs> I like it. I'm Katie Pass from the Minnesota Environmental Quality Board, and I'm also an avid canoeer, so I'll, I'll go with that one. <laughs> <laughs> Kristen Rose, local government coordinator with the Environmental Quality Board as well, and I don't do it often, but tubing down the river. Oh. Sarah Carson, which I'm not and you ask right now, how do we make so important? <laughs> uh, Phil Music at the NPC. Um, well, I'm not sure if actually see, but having recently been in California, seeing my parents. Alexis Jonas with the MPCA, and I would say just relaxing by a lake in the fall. Hi, my name is Laura Monglis. I'm with Siemens, and I'm terrified of water and being <laughs> in water for long periods of time, but I do frequent the polar plunge, you know, the sauna to the with the polar plunge. Wait, you're um, terrified of water, but you do the most extreme. Yeah, plunge. well, because you're only in there for like 20 seconds. Yeah, but it's cold. And you have a supervisor usually who's like on board to pull you out just in case the undertow gets you. And... <laughs> but it's, you know, this it's great for the skin. <laughs> I'll skip the plunge and just Hi, I'm Jeremy Gumke, City of St. Anthony, Department. And um, I would say probably attempting horrible backflips off the pontoon instead. Usually <laughs> result in a belly flop, which gets a great rise out of my kids. <laughs> Whatever it takes. I'm Sean Chesky, Land for Stability, and I really enjoy being in and like hanging out of um, like in Big Hat Creek or a bunch of like hanging out under a rock in a pool. It's kind of like sort of a uh, get your child if you were like trying to raise your feet on a rock and like sitting in the current. And online, we have from Matt Metzger taking my two dogs to the Mississippi River or Minnehaha Creek where they can swim. And Brad Blackett says, playing in the snow, dancing in the rain. Yeah, if you haven't been to Minnehaha, dogs are here. Yeah, dogs still the same. Um, well, thank you all. Uh, it's, I mean, water is incredibly versatile, and it's amazing that we can all kind of have different things. There's a lot of things I suppose, but. Um, we can all think of different ways that we, we love to play in water and listen to water and drink water and use water for all different purposes. And so 
Um, I think that we have a really great agenda. Um, the governor has a goal of reducing water pollution 25% by 2025. And so I'm excited to kind of hear the first report out, I think, of, of that report from Katie Pratt um, in a few words since I had it. I want to say Outlook is for, for Minnesota. And then Brooke Oswaldson and Rachel Olmson of the PCA will talk to us about um, some public education around how we can reduce the amount of salt that we put on our roads. That is one of my biggest pet peeves as a dog owner. I think maybe you saw that in one of the emails. Um, my dog is very sensitive to themselves on sidewalks, and um, we have to do a lot of kind of walking around and on people's property to get through that. Um, and then, is Teddy Chris Oh, but she'll be here. She'll be here. <laughs> 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 maybe second traffic, but she'll get the, the perspective from, from shore view. Um, so, with that, <coughs> I guess Katie, or Kristen, did you have a fun I'm gonna fact? I'm going to come back at the end. Transition. Oh. Katie, you can come back. Oh, no. okay. <laughs> fun fact at the end. Okay. Good. I was kind of nervous. It'd be hard to follow. <laughs> so, um, do you have a tight grab? Yeah. Nice. Oh, yeah. <laughs> great. Thanks, everybody. It's great to be here this morning on this balmy above zero day. I mean, it feels like summer, right? And hi to everyone who's joining us online. Um, so. My intent in the next 20 minutes is just to give you a brief snapshot of the 25 by 25 water quality improvement goal and the engagement process that we had around that this past summer and fall. And this is meant to sort of frame the more deep dive that you all are taking on SALT uh, for the rest of the day because SALT is one of the topics that we heard about through the 25 by 25 process. But this is going to give you a brief overview and um, we won't have a chance to kind of get into everything. but if there's more questions that, that you can't get answered in our time here today, feel free to contact and follow up with me after this presentation. So without further ado. Oh, sorry. We're talking about water quality. Mm -hmm. Carry on. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, oh, I, I totally oh, that, okay. Oh, there it is. Okay, perfect. <laughs> um, so just a reminder again, my name is Katie Pratt and I'm with the um, Minnesota Environmental Quality Board. And we were sort of asked, Environmental Quality Board, as many of you know, has citizen members and state agency commissioners who serve on the board. And so we touch a lot of areas across state government and have a lot of uh, partnerships throughout the state. And so we were asked on behalf of the governor's office to sort of project manage the 25 by 25 process. And so that's kind of our role in this. So about a year ago at the Minnesota Environmental Congress, the governor announced this goal of improving water quality across the state 25% by the year 2025. If we just do the things that we're doing now, all the great work that's already going on in improving water quality, we're only going to get to a six to eight percent improvement by 2034. And the governor said that is not enough. That is not fast enough product, uh, progress. What can we do to really accelerate change on this? And so let's have a goal and let's think about how we can work together. And the messaging from the governor's office all along is this is all of our responsibility as a state. We all play a role in meeting this goal. And the other part of this was the governor said, you know, I really want to hear what Minnesotans think, how, what should be our priorities and how we should get here. And this was in part two, you know, the governor, as many of you know, has received some criticism for the way he handled sort of the buffer initiative that was, that was seen by some as this real top down executive sort of action. And he, and he took that criticism to heart and he said, no, I really want to start with the people. I want to hear what they, what they have to say. And so we organized 10, town hall meetings across the state, one in each of the soil and water conservation district areas, because there was another acknowledgement in this process that one size fits all solutions for improving water quality don't work. We have very different geography, economies, culture across the state, and so we need to have a more regional localized um, solution. Here you can see sort of the main um, agencies that were involved in the planning and carrying these out. Um, so our town hall meetings themselves were structured a little bit different than a typical town hall meeting where you have somebody at the mic kind of spouting off their opinions and so on. Um, they were organized using what's called a world cafe style or small group discussion format where people, we had some presentations um, to kick off the meeting and then the bulk of the time of these two hour town halls was spent in small group discussions and folks were asked to move different tables um, twice throughout the, 
uh, well, they sat at three different tables throughout the evening. And so they had about a 20 minute conversation, got up and moved to a different table. And it was really kind of a phenomenal um, process where you saw people come in and sit with the people that they knew, their community and their folks. And then by the second you know, round, there was more mixing. And by the third round, people were pretty well mixed. And so you had some real um, productive you know, dialogue. And as one of my colleagues said, she sat at a table in a meeting where the beginning of the meeting, folks were kind of entrenched in their you know, NGO or I'm a farmer attitude. And by the end of the conversation, they were sharing recipes. And so it was a really um, great you know, positive experience. We used a, a tool called Pigeonhole, if any of you are familiar with that, to sort of capture some of the um, some of the discussion from the evening. So people at their table, somebody would have a cell phone and they would they would type in the um, sort of top ideas from their discussion. Besides the town halls themselves, we had other ways for folks to engage. So we created um, discussion guides and information packets for folks to organize what we call their own community water meeting. Here's a, a picture from one. So this was just, you know, people at their business and their in their homes, their organizations could lead a discussion about water quality, do it on their own terms, because we recognize, you know, a town hall meeting isn't the, an accessible format for everybody. So they could hold their own meeting and then send the input back to us. And so that was a really great way to sort of expand the, the bench of engagement. Um, we also had uh, just a survey on our website so an individual could go on and submit input. And a lot of the agencies, as they were out and their commissioners were out traveling the state, they had some of their own stakeholder listening sessions to talk kind of more in depth with some of their constituents about these issues. So we had this, you know, sort of multiple ways to engage throughout the process. I just want to, you know, plug here for you all as, as local government folks, um, just how critical our local partners were in this process. From the very beginning, we were um, reaching out to local government folks in each of the regions. We had sort of local government teams in each of the regions that were our go-to people. We asked them about, you know, the design, how, you know, would, would the way we're putting this process together resonate in their area. We asked them um, for feedback on the materials we were putting together. And then there was also super huge in getting the word out to, to folks in their region and then just you know, helping with the events and so on. So huge, huge plug for our local partners. So what did we come up with at the end of the day? So we had more than uh, 2,000 people attending a, a town hall across the state. We were pretty, um, pretty happy with the with the turnout. Even up in Crookston and Ely, we had about 200 folks showing up that evening, which we thought was great. Um, more than 500 participated online. We had other, you know, other ways people participated. We had a booth, a sort of a table, interactive table at the Metro Water Festival in the Twin Cities, which is an event that fourth graders from across the state come for the day and learn about water. So hundreds of fourth graders passed through that. We also had some folks like set up a table about 25 by 25 at the at their um, you know county fair and lots of um, great things going on and out of this we had you know 3,500 comments about what we can do to uh, improve water quality the other thing I would say it was a great showing of our state leadership and sort of a united front the governor attended all but two of the town halls and we had state agency commissioners health MPCA DNR um, Bowser showing up at these, and, and again, I think that United Front is really important to people. Nobody knows or cares what you know MBCA versus DNR does, but the fact that all our leadership are there together, sort of making a commitment to this was really important. So, what do we ask people? Um, we ask people what goals should we establish in their region? What you know, that's kind of what are their top priorities? <coughs> what actions are needed to get to these goals? And what are the specific next steps that we need to do right now to sort of move this whole world. So what do we hear back? Um, first, a few high-level reflections about what we heard. One is that the comments were all over the map. We heard everything under the sun. And oftentimes, um, you know, the comments were quite broad, like, you know, we need, you know, we need to use less nitrogen. We need more education. And so 
you know, and I think this was a result of the way that people, you know, type a an answer into their pigeonhole. They're not going to give us a well thought out, you know, 100, 100 word essay on exactly what we should do there, just give it some talking points. So there was some, you know, interpretation that we did and thinking about how do we make the best sense of these sometimes very broad, high level comments. Also, the number of people um, pointed out, and by the way, did anybody in this room attend any of the town halls? Out of curiosity. Kristen had to, because <laughs> she was helping. Um, but you had these really robust, really rich table discussions, and then the, you know the the output that we captured didn't didn't capture that richness. So that's just part of you know, part of the process. It was not just a data collection exercise. It was an engagement process, and we happened to get some data out of it. Um, the other thing that was interesting is we specifically asked people about goals. But really, they dove right away into actions and strategies. This is what we want to do. This is how we this is how we do it. Um, and what we have, you know, through the process, what we sort of came to realize, and we heard too from a lot of our partners, is that the 25% goal is maybe not as productive to kind of hold up as a state or even a regional thing, but it's going to become very meaningful when organizations or units of government adopted in their own practices and planning processes. So really getting the partners to say, oh, you know, we have a statewide goal of, of um, improving water quality 25% by 2025. Here's what my organization is doing. Here's how we're going to use that goal and, and set it in a way that makes sense for us. So that's sort of high level reflection. And then what are the top themes we heard in the comments? So this is interesting. This was kind of a surprise to us that across the board, the biggest thing that we heard throughout the state in all regions was we want more education on water quality improvement. And we, you know, it, it makes sense now, but we weren't necessarily expecting to hear that. And again, it was it was not it, it was just stood out so clearly. So let's pick this apart a little bit. When people used the word education, it was clear that they meant a lot of different things. Anything from people talking about K through 12 education, so school system, to in some cases more peer-to-peer uh, -peer education of farmers or other technical experts. Um, and there was also kind of a sense of education as a general awareness, broad media campaigns, sort of building a water ethic. So it was all was all over the map, um, and we, there's a lot you know there's a lot I can say about this as we've been trying to sort of make sense of this as as the staff who have been involved in and looking at the data and you know some people are quick to dismiss and say well education that's just an easy thing you can always just say well we need ed more education but the comments reflected more depth of thinking than that and and I think one of the take home messages is that. Education is really something we all can do, whether it's in your home, whether it's in your school, your place of work. We all have a role to play in thinking about how do we, you know, how do we influence the people around us on water quality. Um, you know, it was clear that education shouldn't just be, you know, government educating the people or the experts educating the, the not as well informed. Everybody has expertise to share on this issue and everybody has perspective. Um, so I think that's a you know plug for you all as, as local government folks to think about you know, how do your organizations further sort of an education um, approach. The other top theme that we heard, and this was especially strong in our agricultural areas of the state, but we heard it in urban areas um, as well, is that we need to hold more water on the land. Reducing runoff is you know one of the top uh, ways we can get to water quality. The volume of water that we have um, running up our landscape creates a number of problems. It creates erosion. Um, it, it, you know, uh, you can set sediments and pollution that are entering our waterways and causing problems that are very difficult to um, uh, to reverse. And so, if we can stop the problem where 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 you know upstream by holding the water in the land, we're going to save ourselves headache and time and effort. Um, in the long run. And so you can just see these are some of the top strategies that folks suggested within agricultural areas and urban areas for how we hold more water on plants. And then sort of the list of, um, you know, so those were kind of the top two, but then other strong themes that we heard throughout the feedback. 
One is people want to see better collaboration, working together across all levels of government more effectively, more efficiently, more clearly. Um, people, you know, pointed out in the comments they, you know, they don't always feel like agencies and units of government are on the same page. Sometimes they're working across purposes. Sometimes our processes for applying for grants and so on are are not as streamlined and smooth as they could be. So, a call for better collaboration. A call for locally led watershed planning. So there was there's two pieces of that. One is that you know, there's a huge call in the comments that solutions to water quality improvement need to be locally driven. It's people in the area who know the best solutions for their part of the state, for their topography, for their particular issues. And then also that this watershed scale approach. So we can't, when we're thinking about water quality improvement, you know, just stopping at county boundaries and at city limits is not going to get us there. We need to think holistically about a watershed. And so how do we how do we make sure that you know, all of our watersheds across the state have a strategy for, for kind of a locally led planning solution? Pollutants in drinking water, um, you know, people mentioned a whole range of, of different pollutants, pollutants they're concerned about um, that cause, you know, biophysical problems as well as human health concerns. And reducing salt pollution, the one you're going to talk more about today, I I'll say one more thing about this. Reducing salt pollution, um, we heard it extensively in the metro area. It was probably the top theme. Like, and we had three, we had three townhouses in the metro area in Burnsville, Stillwater, and in North Minneapolis. And in Stillwater, it was very close to education as one of the top concerns there. Um, but we did hear it throughout the state as well. So people are, you know, there is some broad state awareness of the need to reduce salt pollution. Reducing the number of failing and inadequate septic systems, that was a top theme in the northeast area of the state out of the Ely Town Hall. Um, and then, you know, very strong calls throughout the comments that, you know, we need to adequately fund this work um, that, you know, uh, especially local government, so in water conservation districts, cities, counties, and so on, for carrying out work, you know, day to day, boots on the ground, doing this, they can't do effective work if they don't have sustainable long-term funding to get to get the work done. And another call was that, um, you know, there were parts of the state that really felt that incentives were um, what's going to drive change, and other areas that felt that, you know, more regulation and accountability was going to drive change. And so if you step back and look at the whole of the state, you can kind of infer that we need both. We need both things, and that some are going to resonate with with some communities more than others. Okay, and then reducing salt pollution, I just pulled a couple of quotes for you to start to frame up your, your conversation you're having the rest of the day, but um, you know, people were not only acknowledging this that this was a problem, but they were also giving us some of the solutions that they think they, they need to do, you know, smart de icing, um, financial incentives for city, for cities considering um, limited liability, um, legislation which you all I think will maybe touch on. Yes. Shake their head. Yes. Um, yeah. And so, you know, proper training and so on. So these are some of the things folks are are talking about um, in terms of health, which is this. Um, what's next? So, right now, the governor and his staff are reviewing all the input we've put together, sort of a report, and their office is thinking about. Um, so that report is, and to looking ahead to legislative session and kind of coming up with some of their strategies. We are expecting that the governor will make kind of a, a you know have a press conference maybe within the coming months to just report back to the public and 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 um, share some of his takeaways from this process. I don't know what's going to happen from um, his office in terms of specific actions. So we'll, I'll stay tuned to hear more about that. But the one plug I will give is, um, you know, my learning throughout this process is really where the power in reaching this goal is coming from, is coming from local government and local partners. The governor has one, you know, one less than a year now in office, and while he is an important anchor and voice to, to you know, keep this initiative moving forward, really it's going to be up to all of us to reach this 25% improvement goal. And I think what people showed us throughout the state this summer and this fall is that we, we can get there. We have the strategies, we have the tools, we have a lot of knowledge, um, but we all have to kind of roll our sleeves and dig in. And, so that's what I have.
have. Do we have a, just a couple minutes for questions? There's a perennial review of like water regulations and things that can become like a plan. Uh, and have they were one interested like how to maybe add trash. It's one of the things that Minnesota looked at since it's not really required from compliance or anything else. Uh, I, I guess I could ask somebody else from the PC about trying to maybe send in some comments about that. <laughs> Uh, with I mean, like with the Friends of Lake Highwater, uh, they don't have any way of really getting at all the trash from the Right, right. Do you, Rachel or Brooke, do you know? I mean, I've heard about that trash issue, and it did come up from some of the public comments, but um, no, not really. I know that the, we do a triennial review of our water quality standards, and so that might be an appropriate um, format to submit those comments. Okay. Yeah, I think it is kind of that, that particular comment that doesn't fit nicely in any, you know, so, so I would say that that trail review or else um, maybe some of the permits, there might be a different like a public notice comment for maybe one of the permits where that would fit nicely into one of the agency's permits. That might be another kind of a public comment period to raise that issue. But I think if you, the triennial, you already have the deadline for that. Okay, yeah, right. Go ahead and, yeah. Yeah, I'm curious in the um, from people who were frustrated with progress on water quality, was there a, a sense that uh, state and federal agencies weren't sort of doing enough, or was it a sense that at the local level, so the um, county uh, watershed districts, please, was it a sense that why aren't we having more sort of effect back at the local level? Um, yeah, I mean, I think. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think I think you've heard, um, and, and by and large, I would say the sentiment, of, uh, you, you know, the main sentiment of, uh, expressed throughout this process was not one of frustration or doom and gloom or, or blame. And there was a lot of messaging, both on the part of our leadership as well as local. We had the local speakers at each of the town halls. Um, there was a lot of messaging around we're done <laughs> blaming people. We don't. This is not about blaming. It's kind of moving beyond that. But I think you heard frustration that, um, you know, sometimes it was a kind of confusion of we don't know who is doing what or how to kind of best get our needs met. Um, you heard, you know, there's certainly frustration, I think, on part of the agricultural community that um, there's a, you heard, heard express a sense of misunderstanding that folks in the city or in St. Paul or outside of the agricultural community don't understand the realities of, of working farms these days and that they have expectations that don't don't make sense to farmers and that farmers have a lot of great solutions. So you heard those kind of, there's more frustration I'd say has been around, around misunderstanding rather than sort of a blame or somebody's not picking up their not doing their work or something like that, but more how do we how do we bring our understanding, you know, in alignment if that makes sense. And I think that goes back to the education piece. That was part of what you heard in the education is how do we educate how do we educate each other so that we, we understand each other across government, across different geographic areas of the state and, and so we're talking the same language and not talking across the language. No, no, it makes sense. I mean it's a very fractured, certainly regulatory environment, you just don't quite know who to go to in terms of water quality, quantity, scales. My, uh, you know, kind of not being someone who is a lifelong water quality person, I'm coming to this work sort of more from other areas. And my observation coming in, kind of get thrown into this water project is that water regulation and water quality improvement is a universe of mess, is what I call it. <laughs> it it's really messy. Yeah. And, and part of that is um, just, you know, historic, you know, the way that our, our systems, our institutions have been built. But it's also because water is very, very complex, you know, resource culturally, politically, you know, biophysically. And so there, there, there's just this complexity to it. And I think, you know, it's one of these great, you know, people call them those wicked problems or these, you know, these really, really tough problems that um, 
you know, they, they're complex by design and we have to figure out how to wrestle with that. But certainly we can do a better job of helping people navigate some of these, some of these uh, institutional uh, arrangements. Um, how is the 25% consistent with signs and measures? Yeah, and so the way the governor's office sort of, um, you know, thought, thought about it initially is it's a 25% improvement in aggregate across the state. So it's not that every water body is going to improve 25%, and it's not that they're all going to improve in the same way. So one area or organization, you know, one, the way we kind of got into this initially is each region was going to decide what their 25% improvement is. So the Northeast, they might say, by year 2025, we want to have um, the 25% more functional subject system or whatever it might be. So the idea was that each area of the state would define their own kind of measurable, um, you know, measurable way to get to that goal. <laughs> Again, sort of the learning that we had is that even at a regional scale, that's too big of a scale to set those goals. So I think the idea is that the 25% improvement goal is going to be each organization setting for themselves or a lake association for our water body. This is what our 25% improvement is going to be. Now, if everybody were to do that, then yes, we would see by 2025 an aggregate a 25% um, improvement across the state if we all set our own goals. And so it's not, you know, it's not a specific measurable target, and it, that was by design. But the governor's office, again, they thought, I don't want to set this executive, you know, you know, sort of line in the sand that everyone must meet. That's my, not that my role. I want to inspire action and encourage action. Take the 25% with a little bit of my So, no pun intended. Yeah, very little train. Yeah, yeah, very small. So, a lot of the conversation is around water quality. Were any of those conversations kind of circled around with quantity? Yeah, great question. So, um, yes, water quantity did come up. It came up most heavily in Stillwater, in the Stillwater Town Hall. Um, which you can, I don't know if you know anything about that area, but you know, the issues we've been hearing about with White Bear Lake and, um, and they're having some, some real aquifer, uh, you know, uh, issues that they're having to grapple with right away. So, so you heard it right to the top is in that um, area. It come up across the state. Um, I was going to say something else that I just lost the train of thought. Um, but yes, water, oh, I was going to say that water reuse was also an issue that came up in relation to water quantity as, you know, a solution that we really need to be, um, you know, uh, rolling up our sleeves and getting further along with the water reuse idea to address water quantity. Yeah. Okay. Great question. Great. Can you use that? Sorry. I know. I, I'm, I'm following your list. You're the facilitator. If you keep asking questions, then I'm not worried about time. So. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how the tribal nations were engaged in some of that? Yeah. And so um, I'll talk about tribal uh, nations as well as, you know, sort of, you know, folks of color and so on more broadly. We definitely made an effort. There was um, communication sent on the, from the governor's office directly to um, to the tribal representatives that they liaise with, and so there was a you know a pointed effort to to reach out to tribal government um, at the very beginning of this process. There was also um, some efforts made, like the North Minneapolis Town Hall. That location was you know specifically uh, chosen to make it more accessible to. Uh, folks in North Minneapolis who might not otherwise travel to other parts of the, the city to, to, be in, to be involved. <clears throat> that said, this project, I would say our outreach in general was not, this was a project that happened really fast with no budget and no staff, and so we did our best with, um, with outreach. We wished we could have done more, and especially to target some of those you know, underrepresented audiences. If you looked around the room across the town halls, um, you know, there was a great mix of folks. I would say a lot of the folks were people that had some kind of prior connection to these issues. Either they were involved in their local community, they were professionals in the water sector. We weren't drawing a lot of people who were fresh into this issue, 
um, which as you all know from your processes and public meetings, it's just really hard to reach beyond sort of, you know, to expand the bench on, um, on who you're talking to and who you're engaging in these processes. I would say if that, you know, that, that's future work for us, I would say that is something we need to um, consider, you know, sort of the version 2.0 or phase 2.0 of engaging people around water quality is how do we begin to talk to some of those other audiences and different audiences that you bring. Um, we did see, you know, just to um, give you a realistic picture, we did see at a number of um, a number of the town halls, we did see protesters, specifically protesting line three, and some of those were some of our tribal organizations um, coming to protest the, the line three issue. So, um, you know, and the governor was there for a lot of those, and you know, welcome people to you know express their their rights to to have their voices heard. Thanks so much. I have to head off to another meeting, but again, if you have any further questions or ideas or thoughts, um, feel free to reach out to me, and I'm happy to talk 25 by 25. <laughs>
And so that's something that we need to ensure as we're going through and trying to figure out how to address this issue is make sure that we're meeting both the needs of water quality as well as the intended purpose of using that material as public safety. Um, and water softening. Um, so this is a map showing um, the hardness of water across Minnesota. If it's red or orange, the water is hard to very hard. So, you know, pretty much majority of Minnesota has hard to very hard groundwater. And 75% of us rely on groundwater as our primary drinking water source. Um, so we, most of us will utilize groundwater for drinking water and that water is going to be hard and therefore softening comes into the picture. Um, and so that water softening is going to be, that fluoride is going to behave just like it behaves with PCIC salt in that once it's introduced to the water, um, there's not an easy solution to remove it. So our wastewater treatment facilities do not have um, the ability to effectively or cost effectively either remove that chloride from the effluent. And so it's just going to pass through the wastewater system directly into um, the surface water that that uh, wastewater treatment plant discharges to. Um, and so as I kind of alluded to is that chloride you cannot remove it from the environment. So once you introduce it to the water, it doesn't, um, you know, attach to particles and settle out in ponds. Um, there's no plants that are really going to take it up or break it down over time. So that chloride is going to essentially remain chloride with wherever that water molecule goes and, and kind of follow it throughout. Um, and the reason that is a problem is because chloride is toxic to aquatic life. So that one teaspoon um, of salt in a five gallon bucket of water, that's the level at which chloride will start to have negative impact on the aquatic life. So that's where we're gonna start to see changes in um, the available food cycle, the um, organism's ability to reproduce. Um, and so that's where we start to see negative impacts is at that 2.30. Um, and then it, it gets into groundwater as well. So it's not just the surface water. Now for groundwater, um, you know, it's going to be a taste issue, so there's not a, a health concern for chloride um, getting into drinking water, but at about 250 milligrams per liter, it starts to taste salty. And I don't know if any of you have heard, um, some of our friends over in Wisconsin, in Madison, Wisconsin, they actually did get their um, drinking water contaminated with salt, and they have salty tasting water. So they have a very urgent and serious issue in Madison, Wisconsin, because they've got a lot of unhappy residents that have salty tasting water. And so now they're trying to um, kind of fix that. And so with this, you know, particular, it's uh, a lot easier to try to deal with it ahead of time than wait until your drinking water tastes salty. Now, thankfully we, in Minnesota, we have very deep aquifers that we draw our water from, our drinking water from. Um, and so we have not seen high levels in our deep aquifers, but our shallow aquifers we have seen it. Um, and then just some other um, impacts that we've learned over the years is that um, the University of Minnesota, um, they did a road salt balance. They looked at all of the different sources of DIC salt um, for the Seven County metro area based on purchasing records, did some monitoring, and found that 78% of that salt is actually sticking around locally. It's not just going down the Mississippi River. Um, and they also learned, they did some detailed um, monitoring of some lakes and found that uh, the chloride had different levels in the surface of the lake versus the deepest part of the lake. And that was affecting the lake's ability to properly mix and turn over. And so those were both two really important um, things that we've learned over the years through that research that's helped us better understand just how, you know, how big of an impact is salt having on the environment. Besides, we know it's not just water wise. We're learning that there's a lot more negative impacts. There's also some newer research on um, salamanders and amphibians that is affecting their ability to, to reproduce. Um, so I think that it may be still unknown kind of how far reaching the, the effects of, of salt that on, on them. And now we're going to switch again here. We're going to like a smooth handoff with the <laughs> clicker. Rachel's I'm going to cover this part. <laughs> yeah, so I'm just going to give a brief uh, high level overview of the water quality conditions that we're seeing in Minnesota. So this is a little bit hard to read, but here we have the whole state. Or <laughs> sorry. Um, and these areas, so there's some red lines and dots that you can kind of see, like a high concentration in the metro. 
Um, these are areas where we're seeing chloride concentrations above that 230 milligram per liter standard. So at that point, it is going to start affecting our aquatic life. And then there's also some yellow points and lines on here too. And these are uh, water bodies that are really close to exceeding that 230 milligram per liter standard. So those are more like a high risk water body. So eventually we think that these water bodies will also be impaired. So currently there's actually 50 uh, chloride impairments if you count the three new ones that are gonna be added to the 2018 uh, impaired waters list. But this is the importance of an impairment. And keep in mind that um, really a lot of our data has been collected in the Twin Cities seven county metro area. So about 80% of all the data that we have is from that seven county area. And also keep in mind that you know there's a lot of lakes and wetlands and streams just in the metro and across the state. And really in the metro, we've only been able to sample about 10% of the lakes and streams and wetlands. So there could be a lot more impairments out there. We just don't have the water quality data to show that. Um, so in the metro, there's 19 lakes, uh, 16 streams, and four wetlands that are impaired for chloride right now. And I talked briefly about that high risk. So there's about 40 water bodies that are really close to exceeding that 230 that might be considered in the future. Uh, and the Met Council has done a lot of great work looking at the data that they've collected over the years. And they've um, found that we're seeing increasing chloride concentrations even in our large river systems, which is pretty incredible to think about all that water and the dilution factor. We're still seeing these increases. So in the Mississippi, Minnesota, and the St. Croix River, we're seeing that. But these are still, the chloride concentrations in these large rivers are still very low, but they are increasing. And this just shows uh, more of the Twin Cities metro areas. So here you can see those red and orange areas are the high risk and impaired water bodies. And then these blue areas here are areas where we do have enough data and we found that those um, water bodies are not impaired for chloride. And this map is available on our road salt webpage uh, at MCCA. And it's actually an interactive map. So you can click on any of these water bodies and it will give you information on how many samples have been collected, how many exceedances there are, and that sort of thing. So if you're a city and you're interested in like your area, you can go in and find the data that we have for that area. Um, so this is a graph from the State of the River Report. So they did a really great job of highlighting chloride. Um, lots of great figures and tables and information in that report if you're interested. But here's showing that um, We've seen an 81% increase since, from 1984 to 2014 in chloride. So that is a really significant increase that we've seen over time. So the PCA also goes out and collects groundwater data from our shallow aquifers. And we're seeing elevated concentrations in that shallow groundwater as well. About 30% of the wells where we collect data are actually above that 230 milligrams per liter standard for chloride. And about one third of the wells have been showing increasing trends in chloride over time um, across the state. And this little table just kind of shows on average that we're seeing higher chloride concentrations in our urbanized areas where we have residential and commercial land use compared to um, undeveloped areas where we see lower concentrations of chloride. And then this is just illustrating that data um, on a map. So you can see these red and brown dots are areas where we have higher chloride concentrations. And a lot of these are really in more urbanized areas like the metro. Um, you can see up by like Cloquet and Brainerd, we have higher concentrations of chloride in our shallow groundwater. So now we're going to talk a little bit about what we've done the past few years to address our item problem. All right. Um, so we've been working on this for several years. Um, I started um, about 10 years ago at the agency, and I think a year into um, my time at the MPCA, I started looking at um, chloride and specifically the TMDL areas. But then we soon expanded and decided to kind of take a metro-wide approach 
um, to addressing this issue since it's really, uh, it doesn't matter where you are. It's, it, you know, we have the same source. There's going to be very similar or the same solutions and it's an opportunity to just learn from each other um, and share information. And so we um, undertook a pretty significant effort to have a very stakeholder driven process. We um, worked with over 115 different individuals on various teams to really help guide and inform this process. And so this document, you know, this is just kind of a, here's what we heard and learned, but really the same thing like Katie was saying about, there was a lot of um, information sharing um, and, you know, networks being developed and a lot of relationships built over the time period of this um, that I think has probably been the most successful part of this project was just the relationships and the networking and now the information sharing that um, where we're at now compared to when we first started this project. Um, the chloride management plan, the goal is really to just lay out an overall framework for how are we going to meet this goal of clean water and <coughs> safe roads and ideal water softness. So it's really tough to work that one in because, you know, public safety and then soft water. But it's, it's, they're both very important to the public. People want soft water. Um, it's maybe not a live or die situation like we're talking about with public safety, but it's still they want soft water. It's a very, it's, it's very valued. So um, we try to kind of identify all the different areas where we had opportunities to make improvements. And we picked almost every audience you can think of. We, of course, spent a lot of time working with winter maintenance professionals across the metro to really make sure we have enough resources, information, and tools to help them um, kind of be that front line out there who are out there doing the hard work to actually make some changes. Um, and, and do what we can to support them. Um, but we also try to identify, we've got policymakers in there, local educators, um, we've got drivers. We have a little section for, hey, okay, if you're a, a driver's ed teacher, <laughs> make sure you're talking about, you know, winter driving and snow tires and, you know, get it started early on thinking about how to drive responsible um, in Minnesota in the winter. Um, so we try to find just about everybody. We didn't want anyone to be left out of this uh, huge, salt movement. Everyone's got an opportunity to jump in and be part of it. Uh, and so with this, you know, prevention is really our only option. As said before, treating it after the fact is just not, I mean, from an environmental perspective, it's, we can't do it. You can't reverse osmosis water out of a lake. That's just not uh, going to happen. And it's not economical for wastewater treatment facilities. It would be so expensive. And we'd have this like toxic brine, very concentrated chloride at the end of it. So really we have to get out there in front of the issue and prevent it at the source. Um, and so we really try to work hard to come up with tools and resources to help meet the needs of every individual community, because every community is going to be a little different. So the Sand Creek watershed in particular, water softening, that's their big issue. And then in the metro, you've got, you know, we will Duluth is on the metro, but they have these massive hills they have to deal with. Um, Minneapolis and St. Paul have on-street parking. So everybody has unique challenges um, that they're faced with. And so our goal is to really create some tools and resources to help um, meet the needs of every different community. Um, and so here's just kind of a little bit of a high level that there are a lot of things that can be done at home by private applicators all the way up, you know, to the state of simple steps that can be taken to reduce salt use at no or little cost. Um, and these are a lot of the things that uh, our smart selfie training that we'll talk about in a little bit here um, goes into a lot more detail about and kind of helps people get on the right path to um, making sure, you know, that staff are regularly trained, um, that equipment is calibrated. So that's something that's a no cost solution that if your equipment is calibrated properly, you know how much salt is coming out, you're going to reduce um, the amount of salt you're using. Um, how you store your salt is a pretty straightforward, simple solution. Sometimes if you're building a shed, it's going to cost some initial um, money up front, but um, there's just a lot of very simple steps to more complicated steps like anti-icing. Um, and so that'll bring me into the, the smart selfie training. So we've had a, a, a really great training program. It actually was piloted back in 2006 uh, by Fortin Consulting. They got a grant um, to test out, let's you know, see what this a training might look like around um, teaching salt practices about BMPs. It's a six hour class and it's really a partnership approach. And so we um, partner with a local watershed organization or a city or a county, um, or we've partnered with um, other organizations like the Minnesota Nursery and Landscape Association. Um, MnDOT has been a partner of some of these and we bring together um, a group of winter maintenance professionals. We have both a road and a parking lot. <coughs> class. 
that really, you know, highlights why, you know, solves the problem. There's that education piece, but a lot of them maybe aren't even aware of the negative effects that salt has on the environment, and so just helping them, helping them understand, and then giving them some actual hands-on things that they can walk away from the training and go back to their shop and make some changes. Um, and it looks like we'll hear about one of those, um, one of those examples uh, after our talk. Um, we also have some training videos that have been put together by uh, Mississippi Watershed Management Organization. Um, these are some really wonderful resources. We have them available on our website. We have one for homeowners, so it's really um, helping homeowners understand um, how to best mechanically remove snow and ice. Like you don't always have to use salt. Like here, we'll, we'll show you a quick, you know, two-minute video on how to really scrape ice up, or what's the right shovel for this type of snow that we're having. And then if you do need to use salt, what's the right amount? That's really tough, I think, for the public to try to understand. And so we have a, there's a nice video, and then there's also one for sometimes the person working at the front desk might be asked to go put salt down at the entrance. They don't do that for a living. They have no experience. And so we've got a short, um, two short 10 minute videos that just help give them some kind of basic knowledge and hopefully help them not over apply salt when they are asked um, to take on that responsibility. Um, and so after a class, um, there's a test at the end of it that we do ask that if they pass the test, we will give them a um, certificate. Um, and that is uh, valid for five years. But then we post that list up on our website. And so you, um, if folks want to hire, say, a private contractor who's been certified under the Smart Salting Program, um, you can go to our website and find out who are the contractors in your area. Um, we're working on making that a little more user friendly. Right now, it's kind of a clunky Excel spreadsheet, and that's part of my new job is to figure out how to make that uh, a little easier to use. So um, we will improve it. It's taking a little time. <laughs> uh, it's been a very successful and well attended training. Um, like I said, it's, it's, it's very locally driven. Um, I think for the first maybe five years of the training, people didn't even actually know that it was being funded through PCA. Like it's just the watershed partners, port consulting were out there working together to you know bring water maintenance professionals to these trainings, and um, it's been very successful. Again, my new job will be to update this, but I got a year backlog that I'm working with here and a clunky Excel spreadsheet. <laughs> Um, but we have almost, you know, up to 4,000 people. And now we've actually had a request for statewide, or I mean outside of the state. So um, they will hire uh, Fort Consulting directly. Um, so a lot of Wisconsin, Illinois, um, Iowa, I believe she's been to. Uh, there's a few Michigan on there where they go and get the same class, and then we'll just go ahead and mail them a, a certificate from, because they don't have a certification program. So, um, it's getting even more and more popular. This is just a, a quick snapshot of, of why this is such a successful training program. Because people leave, they actually go and are like inspired to make changes at their own shop. And the results vary, but they're pretty dramatic. I mean, we've got 32% reduction in salt use all the way up to a 70% reduction in salt use. And everybody's um, strategy is a little bit different. And some folks have tracked costs at the same time that they've tracked the actual changes. And everybody who has tracked costs um, has seen a cost savings. So we have not yet heard of any organization that has made a bunch of these changes and been like, oh man, that cost us like $10,000. Everybody has said, even those who switch, so um, the city of Waconia, I did it the same thing Rachel did, okay, there we go. Um, who switched to brine, so that required new equipment, tanks on the back of the truck, so that does cost some initial um, capital up front in order to make those changes. Um, they were having still seen an $8,600 yearly cost savings, so they regained that money back after a couple of years of implementing those practices. Um, so that's like a win-win, like who doesn't want to save money? You know, I mean, I think we all want to protect the environment, but even if that's not your main thing, I think you can't argue with, hey, we can help you save some money too. Um, and now since um, the Metro um, Chloride Management Plan project, um, we created a winter maintenance assessment tool that Rachel's gonna talk more about. Um, and we also decided to create a training, a level two training, that's kind of built around the use of that tool and how to maximize 
the reports and the information that you will gain from utilizing this tool. Um, and so we now also have a level two smart selfie training. Um, it just started a couple, two, about two years ago. So I guess now we're piloted in 2015. So that was like our first tester, but the actual training wasn't rolled out until two years ago. Um, so we're still kind of slowly getting more and more folks to attend those trainings, but those um, um, we're hoping will continue to improve. And the audience is a little different for these trainings. So this audience, we want that supervisor level who has kind of that bigger picture of the overall winter maintenance operations who will be able to know kind of what's going on in all different aspects of their um, winter maintenance program. Now it's right there. Okay, so oh, yeah. Just a quick question. So the Minnesota Street Superintendent Association? Street Superintendents. Yeah, they were the first um, co-hosts of our first level two class. Huh. Street super, I've never heard of street. It's a class of public works. Um, this is a new. If you guys is well, I think I think Mark, are you on that? Um, I'm not personally, uh, but we have people in our organization that are. It's, so it's it's typically the first level of supervision over the. Uh, Plow drivers. Some of these, uh, some of those people are plow drivers, but they're it'd be our first layer of supervision. Okay. So right. they may have budgeting responsibility. They have supervisory responsibility. They have to actually know the work program very well. And they kind of exist in a couple different worlds. They have to do the work, but also do the administrative part of it as well. That's a very yeah yeah very precise. Uh, very. I'm the superintendent of the city of Uh huh. So I supervise street street maintenance. Um, St. Anthony, we don't break it down. I do the streets, park, water, sewer. Yeah, I was thinking usually. But what they're talking about is, is you know, street. I work directly below the director of public works. Okay. I have a crew of 12 um, floor um, truck drivers. And, um, <coughs> truck drivers. So I purchased our salt for the year. Um, I've attended this, both of these, level one and level two. Um, and I also teach and operate. My other quick question is because it looks like fluoride is cumulative and it has no way of being removed. Um, so if we suddenly had all the plow drivers in cities doing this correctly in the metro, um, how long would it take for the our aquifers and water supply to get to the level of Madison where you really have a problem and you have to start filtering out filters. Like how many years is it by us, whatever, to do all this stuff? Like the million dollar question. <laughs> uh, that's, it's really, really difficult to predict that. I mean, we have no idea, we don't even know at this point. There's some good research going on. Um, to try to better understand, like, how is fluoride moving through that subsurface level? How long? What type of soils and geologic conditions? It, it's so variable across the state that fluoride, you know, we could have 10-year-old salt in the subsurface. We could have 50-year-old salt in some places, but just is going to take a long time before it moves through the system. Um, and so what we want to do is kind of reduce it as much as we possibly can at the source and then hope that we'll reach a new equilibrium where nature will start to flush out more than what's coming in. So that 78% is actually where we're at at this point in time. In this point in time, we are putting down too much salt. The natural ability for the water to flush that out, they can't keep up with the rate. If we can slow that down, eventually the hope is that that water will reach a new equilibrium where it'll be able to actually kind of flush that out and we won't have the 78% being retained anymore. You know, it'll be something less than that or at least at a level that is no longer a threat to our aquatic life. And so that's really difficult um, to predict and it's gonna vary so much across the state. And it's gonna vary too on how much salt has been put down in areas where, you know, up in maybe St. Cloud or, um, the Brainerd area where maybe they haven't, they don't have as much salt being applied every year, they might reach that equilibrium a little bit faster than we will here in the metro. So there's going to be a lot of different factors that's going to influence the amount of time, but it's going to take a significant amount of time before we get there. Um, so just, I have no way to predict that mm -hmm. actual timeline. <laughs> that's a good question. Anybody else have questions? 
are those that success story grid slide is that on the website somewhere or we have it in the um twin cities chloride management plan my vision is to create like an actual website of success stories that we can just constantly be updating and adding new i'm sure this was just a snapshot in time when we did this project we put out a call anybody who's tracked their um you know changes in their winter maintenance please share that information with us and we'll post it in this plan but there's been i'm sure a lot more that we could share uh, and probably updates to that some of that data is kind of old um so right now that table is in the chloride management plan and I'm, I'm hoping that in the near future we'll be able to create kind of just a, a spot for it on our web page that we can just highlight all these different success stories and, and build on it and add even more yeah the table is also in the stormwater manual yeah yeah so all the sorry management plan pieces are in the stormwater manual so you can like more easily find what you're looking for there's like hyperlinks to the success story table or educational resources um, it's the Minnesota Stormwater Manual. Yeah. Are you guys going to mention the legislation to limit liability? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Any other questions? Okay, so I just want to talk briefly about this winter maintenance assessment tool. It sounds like some of you have already used this tool. Uh, but this is really interesting. So from the stakeholder process that Brooke was talking about as we were developing the fire management plan, the winter maintenance uh, folks that we were working with said like it'd be really great if we could have a comprehensive uh, list of all the best management practices out there so we know what we can do to reduce our salt. And so they really helped us and they really drove the creation of this winter maintenance assessment tool. Uh, so this tool uh, was formed with this technical expert team and it was made up with uh, Minda, there was county, and city uh, public works people helping us out with the tool and also private applicators. And really the goal of this tool was to develop this easy to use web-based um, computer kind of program to really assess your winter maintenance practices and learn what you can do to improve them. So the tool is online, it's free for anybody to use. Anyone can go on and create an account um, and you can just go to this winter maintenance tool.com or you can go to the Minnesota Stormwater Manual and find the tool that way too. Or you can just call me or Brooke and we can help you find it. But this is what it looks like. So you can just create an account, it's free to use. Um, and then I'll just show you a couple of slides, uh, screenshots of what it looks like. So when you get into the tool, you can pick what you want to assess. So let's say you're just a private applicator that only applies salt to parking lots and sidewalks. You can go in and customize the tool to only show you the questions that relate to parking Or let's say you only maintain high speed roads. You can go in and choose high speed roads and then the tool will only give you those questions for high speed roads. And the tool has all these different categories of winter maintenance, like before the storm, after the storm. So you can just move around. The tool will save your responses as you go. So you don't need to worry about that. Uh, and then, we have each question has a list of responses, and these are color coded. Um, the green are the best practices, yellow are medium, red are poor practices. And one thing that came out of the testing of the tool was some people were saying that they were actually cheating a little bit, like they kept wanting to choose the better answer. So we created a mode in the tool where all the answers are just black. So then you can't. Um, you don't need bias. And one, I think, well, let's see what we have. Well, one other thing I wanted to just mention is each of these questions has little information buttons. So you can go in. If you don't understand the question, it will give you um, more information there, more details. And I think the best part of the tool is really this comment feature. So anybody using the tool can submit comments. So we've had a lot of people submit comments and they've really helped us improve the questions. And also they've given us some data, like we actually did this practice and we were able to reduce our salt by 20% or whatever. So then we can look at these comments and then we'll put them under this button, view comments, and then people using the tool can go in and look to see what other people have been doing. And we have even the name of the person that submitted the comments. So if you're interested in a certain 
practice, you could call, you know, the city of St. Paul and just talk to them and kind of learn from them about how they uh, implemented that practice. Uh, and then the tool, once you go through and answer all the questions, it gives you some reports you can look at. So this is actually real data from the city of St. Paul. So they evaluated their past, current, and what they think they're going to do in the future. And you can see that over time, their best practices, the green practices are increasing, and the poor practices are decreasing. So this is exactly what we want to see. And it's, um, I think, it's been really useful for the cities to have, from what we've heard, to have this type of information. They can show their city council, show their citizens all the great work that they're doing. Uh, the tool also has another mode to it um, called the salt savings mode. And this is where you actually enter in some data, like how much salt did you purchase? Um, and then we have some information that we've gathered from all the people working on these issues um, to kind of give us an idea of if you implement a certain practice, you know, how much salt are you going to save from doing that practice? But since we don't have a lot of you know, research um, in this field and papers being published, uh, this is pretty limited right now on the types of EMPs where we actually have this data for you. So over time, we're hoping to really build this up and get more data from you guys out there. <coughs> so you can use the tool to really evaluate what you're doing, look to what you want to do in the future, develop some long-term goals. And really, you can go in every year and track your progress over time and get some idea of the reductions that you've achieved using that salt data. And we're always constantly updating the tool and working on it. So if you know, we're always adding new practices and making it better and looking at those comments people submitted to help, you know, make the questions the best that we can. Oh, and then I'll just briefly mention what we're working on now. So we talked about the Twin Cities Chloride Management Plan. Well, now we're working on a statewide chloride management plan. So we're going to be taking what we've already created and just updating it so everyone across the state will find it useful. So we just started this project, um, I don't know, a year or so ago, I guess. Uh, so we're updating the Twin Cities plan. So we're not doing any new TMBLs or anything like that with this project. We're just really looking at the strategies that we can do. Um, so we're going to uh, update the plan to incorporate statewide water quality conditions. Um, we also are going to incorporate other regional challenges and opportunity into the plan. Uh, Brooke mentioned dust suppressants. So when we were working in the metro, we didn't really hear about dust suppressants as an issue. But as we've been talking to other people across the state, we've had we've heard a lot about it. So we're going to be adding some more information about that, and more information about water softening. Uh, septic, things like that. So this past summer, we actually went out um, across the state to all these different areas and really talked to the winter maintenance um, guys out there and tried to learn from them about what they're doing, what are some, th some of their challenges. And we also gave them opportunity to use the winter maintenance assessment tool and provide feedback on that tool on how it can be useful to them. So we heard a lot of great feedback, and we're going to be taking that feedback now and updating the plan based on that feedback and updating the winter maintenance assessment tool based on that feedback. Um, and then I think Brooke is going to briefly talk about some other resources. I'll try to move quickly here, keep us um, moving along. Uh, so I just want to mention another great resource that is out there um, that was really specifically designed for cities is the Model Snow and Ice Management Policy. Um, it was um, Smith Partners was hired by uh, Freshwater Society and um, some local watershed organizations, I think, to kind of help um, this effort. And um, uh, we actually have Mark can probably talk a little bit more about um, how useful this is. But from what I've heard, um, this model snow and ice policy really helped uh, basically make it very clear um, up front in a document that would you know, protect um, them legally. Here's how we respond to any given winter event. Here's the things that we are going to take under consideration that includes the environment. So we're going to take into account our resources, obviously the conditions, 
um, but allows, I think, for more opportunity to say the environment is an important and critical factor that we will take into consideration when we make our decisions of how we may respond to any given situation or winter weather event. Um, and so this was really um, crafted with that in mind um, to kind of limit that risk, that liability risk that cities and counties um, and other municipal governments take on when they go out and, um, and it was really crafted by a technical advisory team made up of cities. And so it, I, I've heard great things about it, that it's, everybody really thinks it's a, a huge improvement to anything they've had in the past and is very you know, useful and you can easily um, adapt it to fit the needs of your organization. So I encourage you, we do have it posted on our, our website. I think Freshwater Society might have it available on their website too. So Yeah, you know, I just, even though it's not a, uh, an ordinance, I put it on the green, just put it up under the green step ordinance, model ordinance page so you can find it. And under best practice, 17.6, uh, every resource. Yeah. This and the It's a really nice, no, it's really, it's really well done. I, yeah. 17.6. Stormwater road salt. Uh, we also have a, a salt display that um, some of um, our public works departments have borrowed this for. They do like an open house to the public where they invite the public to come check out the plows and stuff like that. But we have this, this display that has a little kids table. The kids table like really draws them in. The kids love, it's got little mini plow trucks and fake snow and they get to like push the little plow around the city streets. So. Um, we've had several, but I think St. Paul every year uses it for their open house. A few other cities have used Right now it's at the um, Mississippi Management Organization in their main level if you've been there on display. But, you know, we want people to use it and borrow it. So if you're interested, please let um, myself or Rachel know. Okay, and then everybody's been asking about <laughs> saved it for last. <laughs> Make sure you all pay attention. <laughs> um, so. Uh, you, many of you have, have asked or alluded to about legislation. So there's a couple things going on. Um, the Clean Water Council has actually added um, de -ice, a de-icing chloride reduction policy to their policy statement that they submit to the governor's office. I don't know what their timeline is, um, but they do have a copy of the detailed policy on the Clean Water Council's website. Um, but here's kind of their solutions that they include um, that we continue the Smart Salty and Training Certification Program. Um, and provide liability protection to private applicators and for some research funding so that we can, you know, continue to explore alternatives, non-chemical ways of de-icing, um, and better understanding the impacts on the environment. Um, the Minnesota Nursing Landscape Association, as well as Stock Over Salting, that citizen group I had mentioned earlier, um, they are actively pursuing authors for a legislation that um, they're leading really a coalition of a lot of different local um, organizations um, on board, and they're looking for a list of supporters to keep growing that. Um, and their language includes the Smart Salty and Training Program in addition to this liability for the um, private contractors. Um, and then you, you heard from Katie um, that fluoride did come up as a priority for um, the town hall EQB meetings and the MPCA. We've got a lot going on. Fluoride is a um, now made it into our strategic plan as an agency, so we're really kind of elevating chloride as an, uh, a priority for our work, and um, we are um, interested in seeing how all of this legislation, but we are working hard, so I've alluded that I have a new job, and part of my new job is to figure out how do we keep this training program running. Um, up until now, it's been funded with short-term pass-through funds from EPA, 319 funds, and we no longer will have those funds available, and so we need to find a different way to make sure we can continue to offer that training. And so I'm gonna start putting together um, an advisory committee of winter maintenance professionals, local educators, to kind of figure out what's the best way to transition this, what will the training look like? Um, and so that's something that I will be um, spending a lot of my time on now over the next uh, few years, is how do we make sure that this training program um, maintains, um, we can maintain our ability to continue to offer it if it is so um, successful. Um, and that is all we have. That's it, you know, not much. <laughs> a little bit difficult for you to try to digest. <laughs> Sarah, hi. So, uh, everyone's very interested in the legislation. I'm interested to know how the plane has been insured. Is there any updated, um, is, is the plane out of the Do we have any information about the plane out of the And secondary to that, I'm also interested to know, so it protects the contractors, but what about those hiring the contractors 
then do they have a greater fear of liability to them? Yeah, so the New Hampshire, so that's for those of you who aren't aware, this legislation initially started in New Hampshire several years ago. So they um, they have three floor ITMPLs and they were really struggling to make progress. And so they have private applicators, but I think they identified them as like the largest contributor to um, their chloride impairment. And so they um, modeled a new training program, the Green Snow Pro training program after our training. And then they got legislation passed that basically says if a private contractor goes to this training and is certified, they're then protected from um, slip and fall lawsuits. Because we have heard that over and over again that that is the biggest barrier, especially for private contractors. They are, they would rather oversell and cover themselves and make sure that they're protected legally than take a risk of getting sued. Um, and so um, there is legislation introduced now exactly how, it's gonna depend on the language that we end up with. And so I don't know what that language will look like. Um, I think the intent is that both the self applicator and the owner, whoever hires them are both protected, like it's not just but it really will vary depending on the language. Um, in New Hampshire, they've had three court cases where they have had a slip and fall lawsuit, and the three people, three contractors that were being sued had the liability protection, and as soon as the opposing attorney found out that they had that protection, they dropped the lawsuit. And they've had a really dramatic increase in the number of private contractors going to their training. And so that's the other thing that we're looking for. Right now, about 80% of our participants are city, county, DOT, um, it's hard to get the private contractors. It's billable hours, you know, if we happen to have it when there's a weather event. So it's, it's tough to get those private contractors to the door and then even harder to actually have them reduce, reduce their cell use just because of that perception of that slip and fall losses here. So the details, it will all depend on what the language looks like when we kind of get in, in, in you know, how far it, it might go this session. But um, the intent or what you can do is to protect both the private contractor and um, the property owner who hires them. Um, a question, but actually, uh, Danielle, a question for you and the, and the league event for the city. Has the league sort of, in the insurance arm of the league, dealt with these lawsuits that are coming toward cities that are hiring, uh, well, staff or private? The league's insurance trust, have there been payouts on slip and fall crashes? Or maybe not a big, it hasn't. So I'm, I'm not with the insurance trust yeah, sure. right? because of building past insurance and past lawyers. Sometimes it feels like I, I really don't even want to answer the question, but I think it would be ridiculous if we weren't dealing with that. Yeah. Is that <laughs> but it's not like it's like totally yeah. uh, like a massive issue that we're talking about every day in the hall, like, oh my God. I, I mean, Minnesota, so I can't imagine it would be like a magically like something really that would shock and amaze us with the small claims. Um, I would be happy to send you to someone to get better. Yeah, it's not like I think for private contractors in particular, it's a little different. They have no language in place to actually protect their liability. There is language for government entities that says as long as they're not being completely irresponsible with their winter maintenance, like they're protected. Like, you know, and especially if you have a good snow and ice policy, then even more so. But with the private contractors, they literally are completely on their own. So there's no support system there for them at all. That's kind of what the, the intent or the idea of this liability is, is that we can give them some assurances that, hey, if you agree to reduce your salt use, follow the best practices, we'll help you out by giving you this liability protection. That's really kind of what the goal is, is trying to find that win-win, that incentive. That's that other third one on page list that I thought, oh, look, we got an incentive-based thing going on here with the salt issue. So that's kind of the intent. We'll, you know, we have no way of knowing. But this is the most act activity we've ever seen on this issue because it was introduced two times before. No one really heard about it or talked about it, but now we've got multiple areas that it's coming from. Um, and so we will see. Can you guys have an estimate of how much of the salt problem is basically world salting with maintenance truck versus private property with businesses versus residential? Do you have a pie chart of like figuring out any way of how much it's come to this category? So we do have a pie chart for the seven county metro area. 
it varies so much though for every individual watershed. So you could be in um, the watershed that literally has only city and like it's a ton of shopping malls and private contractors versus a community that's mostly county roads and like maybe one or two MnDOT roads or um, a lot of homes. I mean, it, it varies so much depending on where you are. Um, just like kind of the water softening issue. Like in some of our smaller watersheds, 0% of the source of fluoride is from water softeners and others, it's 100%. So it really depends on, you know, your specific community, how much, and in the chloride management plan, we offer, so if a city were to know how much impervious area they have in kind of private um, industrial uses, uh, an estimate, an estimate of how much the typical cell application rate could be, and they'll know what their own contribution is. And so you could actually estimate that within your community. So we did do a broad brush seven county metro area, and they are um, a, a smaller contributor if, if you look at the whole seven county metro area. But I think it's actually really important to look at it at a more detailed level to have that better understanding. Um, but I think we'll all benefit if we can get a reduction from that. Because that's, I, will, I think I can confidently say that we see probably the most overuse from that particular sector. I feel like our government entities are a little more responsible and already cutting back because of cost savings and our, you know, it's, it's that liability and that just, and some of them charge per pound of salt too. So of course they're going to put down as much salt as possible. So I think we see the most overuse happening, even if they might not be like the biggest piece of that pie, we have the best opportunity to see a dramatic reduction in salt use by targeting that audience. I want to get to yeah. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. So we have Ellen Brenna here from Shoreview. Can I share the screen? Yes. Okay. Well, hi. Like, uh, like Abby said, I'm Ellen Brenna. I'm the Natural Resources Specialist from the City of Shoreview. Good morning, everybody. And thank you for having me here today. I'm going to talk a little bit about our snow and ice management practices, specifically as they relate to so Just a quick outline. I'm going to talk a bit about Shoreview. We are where we are uh, and a bit of our history with snow and ice management. Then I'll jump into some of the techniques we're using right now and some future possibilities, uh, how we're measuring our progress and quantifying those results, some of the challenges we've had with this program and the outreach that we've, we've employed to try and deal with those challenges, and then wrap up with a quick conclusion. So this is Shoreview. Uh, for just some context, that logo down there looks like there is about where St. Anthony is. So we're about 15 minutes from downtown Minneapolis and downtown St. Paul. We're in the in the northeast metro, about a population of 27,000 people in a 12 square mile area, and about a third of that area is parks and open water. So you can see why we'd be a little concerned about our our chloride use in that in that area. Got approximately 100 miles of streets that we maintain, and uh, most of our rapid growth occurred in the 70s and 80s. So we do have some aging infrastructure. The, the big takeaway I want you to get from this slide is that we have very high expectations for community services. If any of you have seen our community center, you might know a little bit about what I'm talking about. So in 1988, we adopted our first official winter maintenance policy to deal with liability issues as well as consistency and communication between staff and between staff and residents. Um, we did start out using a sand salt blend, which we shudder to think of now, but was common practice at the time. And uh, our operators and managers attended those first uh, training seminars that Brooke and Rachel just talked about to, to get their certification, and they have continued to do so um, up until now. And uh, in the mid-2000s, we began to invest in new equipment and technologies that has also continued throughout. Um, and really, throughout this whole process, the city has encouraged innovation and education to make sure that that all of our staff is, is aware of everything that's going on, of what we can do, and uh, how it applies to Shoreview specifically. So currently, all of our operators and supervisors go, do go through the MPCA training um, and receive certification. They get certified in road, parking lot, and sidewalk applications every five years, and they audit the seminar every two years. So half our staff will go one year, half our staff will go the next. Shoreview's actually hosted a couple of those at our maintenance facility in the past. In addition to that, we have an internal annual meeting with our public works staff where they review that training, keep those connections between chloride over usage and environmental degradation fresh in everybody's mind, discuss any new salt use or conservation methods that have come up, um, and also kind of most importantly, stress that our chloride reduction goals in Shoreview are not 
budget base. Uh, as Leslie mentioned, they do obviously, uh, it costs less when you buy less bulk, but really our, we know and our applicators know that they're reducing less bulk to, to help our natural resources. They're aware that not only do the applicators value natural resources, but they're aware that uh, our residents value them as well. Um, and I, I spoke to our, our public works superintendent about why he thought that Shoreview and our program in this stood out um, from our other peer cities who are doing similar good work. And what he said uh, immediately was the training, the fact that all of our applicators buy into the science and the, the, the background behind that training. They're aware of what our residents value and, uh, and they act accordingly. So that allows him and the other supervisors to provide really to try each one of those applicators with really high levels of trust. Uh, with what they're done to make them, they, they're aware that they're making the right decisions. And to kind of put that in context or make you believe me a little bit, we've got a, a 12 person, a snow and ice management staff at Shoreview Public Works, and six of those folks have been around for more than 20 years. And there are several that have been around 10, 11, 12. So we do have a very strong legacy of, of winter road maintenance in Shoreview and doing that correctly. So some of the techniques that we actually use, um, we have got an anti-icing, which is a 30% rock salt and water solution that we get from Ramsey County. So that brine is applied to the road, major roads and intersections under Shoreview jurisdiction. Um, it can only be applied, applied uh, as conditions allow. You have to be reasonably certain that it's going to snow. It has to be dry pavement. It can't be too cold. Um, and you can't have blowing or late snowfall. But when those conditions do allow, it stops the first layer of snow from bonding to the pavement. So it can be really effective. Uh, once we already have snow on the ground, we've got a technique called uh, pre-wetting, where sodium chloride brine tanks are mounted to the side of our plow trucks. And that tank will spray out uh, the brine onto the rock salt as it hits that spreader and goes out onto the roadway. That helps it not only activate the salt so it's melting and cruise faster, but it also uh, helps it stick to the road so it doesn't bounce off and end up in those roadside ditches or down a catch basin. So uh, everything in this equipment uh, can be can be greatly controlled. You can control the speed of the truck, the auger, the spreader, and all of that is, is really dependent on the conditions. And so every applicator knows that they go through it in training. And they also rely heavily on, on the pavement sensors, depending on what temperature the, the roadway is at the time and the weather conditions, they definitely can uh, alter, their, alter their behavior and alter their, their speed to, to lay down the correct amount of salt to the correct condition. This is just uh, some photos here. You can see the tank on the side of our truck. And a little bit here, it sprays out onto that spreader. You can see the salt coming down. and then. This one here in the bottom is just sort of highlights that we've always got those temperature controls or, or readings. They are visible, and, and it does make sense uh, for them to take a look at that. So all of our equipment is calibrated at least once a year at the beginning of the season, and often more than once. Uh, some of our equipment is has used for multiple purposes. So if, if something goes off and gets used for a parks maintenance something, and then it comes back before it does any, any salt application work, all that equipment is recalibrated. We also have a, a covered salt storage facility that uh, helps reduce weathering of our, of our stockpile. And in that facility, there's a dedicated catch basin that leads to a tank. So it, it catches all of that runoff and leaching, and then that tank water is disposed of properly once a year. So uh, non-equipment techniques that we use, we, we thoroughly monitor every, every, all the weather and every conditions heading up to an event and during the event itself. Um, obviously, you put down different amounts of salt depending on the road temperatures and the weather conditions and the, the air temperatures as well. Our applicators use a chart by, by the Freshwater Society that dictates the, your, this is your road temperature and this is your condition and this is how much salt you should put down and that's generally how they practice that. And finally, we also have an automated vehicle management system. So that's just used to track where each vehicle is, how fast they're going, how much salt they've used. Um, and it also tracks long-term weather patterns for analysis. So this here is a picture of our covered storage facility. You can't really see the catch basin, it's right about there, but then there's a tank underneath. And then this is that automatic automated vehicle management system from inside the truck. And then up here, it just says, you know, here's your truck number. You've got where it is, the odometer reading, and how many hours it's been on the street, things like that. That's the desk how you So into the, the future, we're looking forward to uh, the, that automatic vehicle management system is going to be wirelessly, uh, be able to transfer data wirelessly. So right now, we have to take that data and automatic or manually transfer it over, and sometimes especially in a month like this month, we get a few winter events before we get a chance to look at that data. So everybody's pretty excited that they'll be able to do that uh, in real time. Our managers will be able to see where the trucks are, how fast they're going, and uh, monitor the weather conditions to make real-time management decisions going forward. And then uh, additionally, our, our supervisors and staff are always keeping up with, with new technology. We attend 
county meetings, the uh, state meetings, webinars, the uh, Rural Cell Symposiums tomorrow will all be there. And uh, so they're definitely always taking what they learned there, coming back to Shoreview, and moving it over, seeing whether or not it would work well for our particular city. So as you can imagine, measuring the progress in a program like this comes with some variables. There's obviously climate variability. You don't get the same amount of snowfall every year. Uh, there's also, of course, changing salt prices if you're monitoring for, for the cost of everything. We do get uh, development, which increases our road miles, which throws another wrench into that. And then, of course, resident comments and calls on the day of the event. So Shoreview, taking all that into account, we monitor how much salt is used for each truck per event. We also monitor how much is purchased annually and is left over at the end of the season. So taking all of that into account, our salt uses has decreased since we implemented all these changes starting around 2006. And uh, even though we have decreased our salt usage, our road miles covered has increased. <coughs> so here's this graph. Um, I apologize, 2016 and 17 are not on there, although they both hover around this 500 ton mark here. So you can see from 2008, we've gone down from over 900 tons of salt to around 500, and we're staying pretty pretty steady. So even with the uh, kitty use might take this with a grain of salt, Joe, a little mm -hmm. bit earlier, but uh, even with all those variabilities, we still decrease significantly the amount of salt that we use uh, on an annual basis. So as you can imagine, uh, that with that large decrease in salt and the fact that we have a lot of residents that have lived in Shoreview for quite some time, they have seen differences in the way that their streets are maintained and how they look. So you do, uh, back to those high expectations of residents, we do receive quite a few phone calls. People expect to drive pavement all year round and they expect to be able to drive 40 miles an hour on their residential streets. So uh, that also, another wrench to get thrown in there, most of Shoreview's major roadways are either county roads or state highways, which are maintained by Ramsey County or MnDOT respectively. So if you've got a resident that's turning off of drive pavement Lexington onto a Shoreview residential street, there's going to be a difference there, and a percentage of those people are going to pick up the phone. When they pick up the phone, they don't always call the same person, so that leads into another issue of uh, consistent language, which we've tackled uh, pretty well this past year, um, and Brooke just mentioned that that model snow and ice management policy, late in 2017, Shoreview adopted our new snow and ice management policy, which means very heavily on that document, um, and it, it just allows us to include environmental considerations in our management decisions. So basically, the policy says that we will manage for safety, convenience, but also for our national resources protection. So that can sometimes lead to mixed messages when you get a resident calling in and saying, I slipped through a stop sign at Mountain Victoria, you have to come out and put some more salt on the road. And our policy says that we did what we what we did, and this is why, and this is what we're supposed to put down for these specific conditions. So that the applicators understand that, they, they definitely understand that residents value their natural resources just as much as as the applicators do themselves, um, and in fact, even though they're not necessarily thinking about the, their lake when they're sliding through a stop sign, they still, it still matters. They're still, overall, uh, it's just an important thing. So the applicators weigh all those variables. We do go out and check every time somebody calls, but we do not always put down salt. So as you can imagine, that doesn't leave somebody happier if they've already called in on that. So to deal with that, mostly we, we do through outreach. And in two different forms, for peers, we do outreach like this, like today in front of groups like this, speaking about what we're doing. We also like to get involved in, in diverse planning and advisory committees like, the, for example, there are snow and ice management policy. We use a lot of the model policy and uh, Mark Maloney, our public works director, helped develop that policy as part of that interdisciplinary group. So we like to get involved that way. We also like uh, to, to kind of get recognition for our efforts. And I apologize, I had the, the, the name or the exact wording for this award. We won an award from the Freshwater Society in 2010 for our excellence in protecting the environment through winter maintenance, something like that. But environmental leadership. Yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. It's on my nose on the PowerPoint, but not here in front of me. So, so that's how we do uh, our outreach for peers, for, for folks like yourself. And then for residents, it looks a little different. We have a bi-monthly newsletter that comes out where we feature articles not only on what to expect on their residential road rate, but also how to reduce salt usage on their own walkway or driveway maintenance for their winter activities. We've got a lot of information up on our website and we post periodically um, on social media. And then another thing that Shoreview has, which is very helpful in this aspect, is uh, we have a citizen committee called the Environmental Quality Committee. And every year they host a speaker series event. Um, and it, you know, we've been focusing on this issue recently because it's, it's important. And actually 
I saw Tara's name on the finance sheet, so I never actually met Tara, but she will be speaking in a, <laughs> she'll be speaking in Shoreview City Council Chambers in two weeks from Wednesday about smart consulting for safe roadways. So that's another way we hope to get some attendance there. And, and then people, once they learn why we're doing what we're doing, then maybe they aren't going to make so many angry phone calls. Maybe they'll be okay with driving 10 miles an hour slower after a snow event. So in conclusion, Shoreview attributes its successful uh, chloride reduction program to the commitment and values of the winter maintenance staff. That's the most important factor for us um, because that importance is placed on the, the training and the chloride reduction in general. Our applicators understand how different conditions require different application levels. They make the connections between their actions and the environment. They're constantly balancing between safety, convenience, and the environment. And that's because they feel a responsibility to Shoreview natural resources and that they know that the, the residents do as well. We get more calls about trail maintenance than we do about road maintenance because people are out on a daily basis using those trails. So, and, and most importantly, I believe um, they feel supported by management in their decisions. You can go to as much training as you want, but if you know that if you're out, you're, if some resident calls in at a certain intersection and your boss is going to send you back out to put more chloride, or chloride down, um, they're going to put it down the first time, so you don't have to go back out. So our applicators, they, they really understand the science, they really buy into it, they really value it, and because of that, our, our managers, are they trust them, and they feel that support all the way up the chain. So if somebody's mad about a certain intersection, it gets all the way up to Mark, he's going to have that, that person's back. So that's really how we how we work in Shoreview. And uh, I've got a little story behind this photo. I was digging around on our servers trying to, to find some pictures for today's presentation. And uh, this is actually, as some of you may have guessed, the Halloween Loser of 1991. Uh -huh. And uh, that is the driver in our lead plow there is actually our current public works superintendent. So he's been there for 29 years. He was pretty excited that I had found this photo. <laughs> <laughs> Joe? Joe, it is not Joe. No, it is Dan Curley. But Joe is our street uh, supervisor, so he's in charge of the day to day as well. And I kind of went pretty fast there. Apologies. But, uh, any questions? Yeah. <laughs> uh, how about so, uh, a data on cost savings? So you've invested in three wedding tanks and uh, uh, brine application. Yes. Looking over like I don't know, ten years, I presume you're seeing. Yes, yes, and I believe, I apologize, I've only been with the city for a year, but I believe that those purchases, Mark, were made quite a few years ago, and we've, we've definitely made back those costs with our salt reduction savings. I, I actually want to make a comment because I do hear the cost a lot, and trust me, salt, the price of salt it is going up. There's, there's a lot of anxiety, especially on, on, mm -hmm. that, on that point, but we do have to keep in mind, too, that at least on the state side, but I know it's true for all operators that if we're not salty, we're out there more. So we're driving those routes more often and we're using blades. Yeah, yeah. So we're using more yeah. high tech blades, which are costly. And, and it's just something because I just want everyone to be realistic about it. You know, like to not, because I, I, I haven't heard, and maybe maybe those costs are factored in some of the, the cost savings, and that's great. But it is something I don't want the locals to be, you know, having these great expectations because the, the way you do the job then is, is manpower operates. Right. Um, right? So those trucks are out more often, they're out earlier, and they're they're clearing the displays. So I just wanted to make that point that that's, that's how we do it with less salt. Which helps lead to the point that we're not really focused on budget. We do have that luxury to be able to be not focused on budget. So I, don't, I apologize. I don't have yeah, no, savings no. numbers here in front of you, but we have our sweet there has to be. No, it's like it's like granite countertops. You know, we'll spend <laughs> more money if we can get your vision goals. Yeah, exactly. Priority. I have a question for you, or maybe anyone else in the room. In general, what who are trusted sources when you're looking to, you know, write a newsletter <clears throat> article to your residents, um, or talk to your chamber of commerce and in your business owners and um, on how to reduce salt on that private side of things. Who might you look to in, in the state or nationally to have good data and facts and information to share? Well, I know for sure we rely pretty heavily on our watershed district. Um, we also have members of that Environmental Quality Resident Committee that are specifically in their own field of study aware of that and they can help develop. Um, for the private part, I you know, I bet there might be somebody else. Connie Ford. Oh, yes, of course, Ford. Yeah, 
yeah, we've, we've helped through some of that. I the watershed districts have done an amazing job. So I think that's probably the best first start, starting point is, or Metro Watershed Partners. Um, they have that clean water group that they have done, done some really good um, stories. It's, it's definitely a little less clear once you get away from the metro area, when you get into out-of-state regional areas that do have fair amounts of private contracts to install applications. It's really unclear to me as to who's going to carry the message that on. Thank you. That's kind of what I'm trying to get at, too, because I mean, we definitely have, you know, in being in the metro and having this meeting here in person and having knowing what, what resources we have in, in the metro, you know, we get obviously a great resources here, but we do have an online audience and, and green stuff definitely goes you know, statewide. And so thinking about how we can better facilitate those uh, resources to our other communities and maybe Brooke and I can work in, um, with our follow-up to our cities and come up with a list of resources. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and that's my new job at the agency. They decided to have a position completely dedicated to chloride specifically and so we're making the training statewide and we're going to try to find what are those new needs um, and hopefully we can help fill that gap. Are there cities in uh, greater Minnesota that have, you know, achieved some of these? Yeah, we've got um, like the city of St. Cloud in particular, um, they've been very progressive and we, the training has been statewide. It's open to anyone who wants to participate. It's Focus on the metro because that's where we have the majority of our partners. We do rely on that partnership in order to offer the training. Um, but we have had several trainings in Duluth and St. Cloud. We'll have another one coming up in Rochester. So we have been getting out um, to greater Minnesota. We just don't aren't able to get it there as often right now under the current um, funding mechanism. It doesn't allow us to really kind of move beyond. It's a little more restrictive on where we can um, go with the training. But the goal is to now that we need a new funding source, now we don't have those restrictions anymore, and we will hope to have it available um, statewide um, soon. The assessment tool. The assessment tool is online, and yep, everybody can use that. So that's something that anyone, even out state, got an email from Virginia. Apparently, the state of Virginia loves their tool. <laughs> and they were concerned we were losing funding, and they sent an email to EPA like, you need to help Minnesota with this tool because we love it. Oh. <laughs> nice. Thank you. <laughs> so anyone can use it. I had a comment and to follow up on what Ellen was touching on there. I, even in a community like ours, which we pride ourselves on having some very progressive thinking about environmental protection, we have a, an audience that has high expectations for protecting natural resources. Even still, it's incredibly difficult to push back on people to say, um, and, and I'll just point to, um, I picked up on Ellen's presentation, she talked about public safety and she talked about environmental, but she's picked up on another thing in local government, you saw the word convenience in there. And, um, and it's a reality that you know we're dealing with, our expectations as a culture is that we can go as fast as we want, whenever we want, and we don't want anything in our way slowing us down because we're all in a hurry, we're all so important, so on and so forth. And so that is like a third factor in the salt equation, at least in reality, in local government. We have, we're prepared to talk about the public safety versus environmental balance that we need to have, but there's that undercurrent of high expectations for people in mobility um, that is also really, really difficult to push back on. And even in our community where we're set up for success on this topic, it still takes us a tremendous amount of effort and courage, frankly, for courage. your leadership in your community. Because um, these people that Ellen are um, referring to that call and are mad because the road doesn't look like it's managed to the same level that NDOT is managing freeways, um, they're going to talk to an elected official. And that elected official is going to need to have a script or some talking points. And so um, I just wanted to get that out there for you that uh, it isn't as easy as perhaps we've made it look. We've had a great culture in our community to work with, but even with that great culture in place, there's still a lot of expectation that comes through. And so um, when Brooke and others were working on this um, uh, Twin City Chloride Management Plan, they very, very astutely engaged locals to get that reality sort of understood in the plan. That this could not come down just as a state agency you know, mandate for locals without understanding the difficulty that we have. So um, that's why it's been successful as it has. Thank you. Did you want to share your fun fact? Oh, yeah. <laughs>